So to discuss all of this, I want to bring in Dr. David Nickel. He's a consultant neurologist at City Hospital in Birmingham, England. Thank you so much for joining us, doctor. I, I want to um, ask you about that new variant, lots of confusion and consternation over whether it's more deadly. Uh, first, what do you make of the data? And then more importantly, perhaps, does it actually matter whether it's slightly more deadly in terms of our actual response? Well, what I would say, so I'm speaking on behalf of the Doctors Association UK. Um, I, what I would say is uh, it's clear that the, um, the UK variant, which shall we call it, is, is um, uh, highly transmissible, and that's probably the most important thing. Um, I, I think if you look at the neurotype report, as I've done, it doesn't show any increased mortality um, for those that are hospitalised. Okay, so um, I think um, when we talk about uh, vaccines and even the, the variants, you know, I think it's really important that. Uh, the medical profession talk about this rather than politicians. It really doesn't help the messaging. So, uh, as we heard, there, there's a, a backlash from some experts in the UK over the decision to delay the second dose for up to three months. Uh, you know, experts uh, are, are weighing in on either side of the issue there. And as I said, we're having similar disagreements around the timing of that second shot here in the US. The CDC says it's okay if it's delayed. The FDA says it's not supported by science. Where do you stand on, on that debate? You know, vaccinate as many people as possible with the first shot or, or vaccinate fewer but stay within the original parameters? Well, the first thing I would say is vaccines are safe, and it's really important if people get a message to be vaccinated, go for it, okay? This debate is a medical debate about the timing of the second vaccine, particularly for the, fi for the Pfizer um, vaccine, and, and that's important. Um, and on the one hand, it's this debate about uh, we're in a public health crisis, um, that should we delay it? But um, actually, I think, is there an opportunity to, for science to help solve this? Um, Sheila Bird, eminent biostatistician, pointed out that, in effect, we've, we're doing an uncontrolled population experimental study without pallet data. So shouldn't we randomise 25% of people to get it at 21 days and the rest delayed? And then we'll have the answer and then we'll end this debate. But it's, it's a real um, anxiety for a, a, a huge numbers of our uh, members, um, both on a consent issue, because obviously the drug was licensed at 21 days, uh, so trying to explain it, so certainly my colleagues in primary care are very concerned about this. Um, uh, and even in, in secondary care, I, you know, I've got colleagues who are very worried to the extent that some of them are shielding. Um, and if they had both vaccines and therefore fully vaccinated, they'd be back at work. Mm. But the bottom line, as you said, uh, if you can get the vaccine, go get it. Now, um, th there has been a big problem in, con in convincing some people uh, to get the vaccine, particularly people of color, uh, up to half of people in some areas uh, with high ethnic minority populations there in the UK are refusing to get it. Uh, it's a, a huge problem here in the African-American community as well. Is the government doing enough to address this? And, and what would you suggest be done to help? No, I don't think they are. And even within doctor association, we've got members, often doctors who are working from overseas, uh, who haven't got an NHS number, who are struggling to get a vaccine. But, um, you know, particularly because the BME community, the black community has been hit um, so severely by um, COVID, it's really, really important, those targeted messaging, particularly for the at-risk groups. And the area I work in Birmingham has got some of the highest rates of COVID uh, in the country. And, um, you know, we're seeing multi-generational families often of ethnic origin being admitted to intensive care uh, in, you know, very, very stressful circumstances. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, if there's a positive note, there's the, the recent news in terms of cases has been largely good. Uh, I think we have a map of, of Europe and the U.S. Um, a, a week ago, they were pretty much, you know, in the red. And now there's a lot more more green, which means things have improved. Um, should we be encouraged by this or as some health officials are warning, do these new variants mean we could well, uh, you know, see a totally different uh, map again in a, in a few weeks? The new variants are a concern, but I highlight, you know, in the UK, uh, it was announced that over 4,000 patients are on a ventilator now because of COVID, and 10% of those are being transferred to other hospitals. That troubles me a lot. Um, there's a real pressure on ITU beds. I I'm a neurologist, a physician. You know, I, I had to go to an operating th theatre to see a patient because that's where the ventilator was last week. All right. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for uh, all of your insights. We appreciate it. Dr. David Nickel in Birmingham, England. We appreciate it. Thank you.
China's relationship with the U.S. hit some major lows during the Trump presidency. How will both countries manage things now that Joe Biden is in in the White House? We'll explore that question just ahead. Please do stay with us.